most of the people here know you in your first chapter as a great tennis player. Um, what they don't know is as much about your philanthropy and then your social impact. But let's start tonight with a little tennis, because I still, to this very day, am always amazed when I read your book open, which is uh, you know, sitting in the appropriate place in my house in the bathroom. <laughs> and you start off by saying, I hated tennis. And how is it possible that someone who hated something so vehemently could be so wildly successful? Yeah, uh, well, that's a loaded question. So we'll save some time for uh, you know, the focus of what we're sort of here about today. Uh, and I'll try to kind of give you a quick overview. But I, I would imagine all you can identify with this in the sense that maybe some of you are, um, are self-motivated and you're here. Obviously, all of you are here because you've overachieved. Uh, some of you, maybe because you're self-motivated, others maybe because this was your parents' dream or, or aspirations for you, so you're sort of, you know, doing what you need to and living with that, with that pressure. Uh, well, that, that was kind of me, the latter. Uh, and my father was very intense on me being the best player in the world. That's all I knew, and, and tennis was the big reason for the disconnect in my entire childhood. Relationship with my siblings, relationship with my father, get sent away to an academy just to focus on tennis. You know, that also left me a bit disconnected. But fear is, you know, a great motivator, and, and I think one of the things that I've learned that might apply to, to you guys, there's much to talk about on the subject, but is you, you all have this um, incredible ability to overachieve, given the fact that you're even here in the first place, and then you get here, and I'm sure you're overwhelmed with your circumstances, and you sort of look around and say, oh, geez, I, you know, I got I to gotta deliver, I got to get through this, and then you sort of say, when you leave here, Wow, I got to do you know Wharton proud, and I got to now succeed, and and you you have these ideas of where you want to land when you come here, where you want to land when you when you leave here. But what I'll say to you uh, that I learned all too late in my life that has to do with what you're asking, Bobby, which is, you know, it doesn't matter uh, really what you're charged with doing. You've already proven, uh, you know, who you are and what your makeup is to even be here. To take stock and and safety in the fact that you're really good and the stress and the perfectionism that you sort of instill in yourself is the very thing uh, that will get you through uh, not just the things that got you here but will get you through being here will also get you through uh, when you when you when you leave here uh, and in between that reality is what you sort of call life and I think one of the mistakes that people make uh, is that they really think they have to leave this environment and land in a specific place. It's why I love this series that you've you know, put together and sponsored for so many years because this series is a moment in your life to maybe reconsider what you're gonna do. And I swear to you, that's the way life works. You prepare for something and then you're a little bit open-minded at different intersections. You run into somebody by accident and the next thing you know, the entire trajectory of your life changes. Uh, we have one of our greatest uh, uh, partners in this uh, came straight from here four years ago. Actually came down this aisle and refused to leave until she, she had a chance to chat with us and now she's doing something she never dreamed in her life she'd be doing. So I'm not, I'm not pitching on you need to be doing what we're doing. I'm just simply saying give yourself the freedom in your own mind to think about life and the definitions of success as, as you define it. And that's what I didn't have with my tennis. I, I didn't define myself by what I did and therefore I was really disconnected with it. And it doesn't matter how much success you have from a worldly uh, outlook, because uh, people really define success different ways. Uh, you, you are truly going to be unhappy inside uh, and not comfortable in your own skin if you don't have your reasons for waking up every day and doing what it is you want to do. Because between now and whatever we define success at, uh, life, life really does happen. Uh, you've experienced it to some degree. Trust me, uh, we've experienced it. Uh, to the degree of 20 plus more years. Uh, so uh, that, that truth will never, never change. So obviously a great success on the tennis court. Um, you became a great success off the tennis court as a philanthropist, one of the great philanthropists. And you're a bit of an outlier. And, I've, and I'd love, and I've never asked you this question, um, why, what makes you different? And why have so few professional athletes uh, been able to embrace a second career and have the impact off a court, like you've been able to have on a court? What's, what's, what's preventing others to follow in your footsteps? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, let, let me first start by saying, I don't separate athletes from the world. You know, I always often look around and wonder why others don't 
uh, do more uh, if they can. And, and some people have a bigger net to cast, no, no question about it. And athletes are sort of high up on that, on that, uh, you know, that judgment seat because they do have uh, a lot of success. They are young, and you would think they have a great runway ahead of them to make make huge impact. Unfortunately, in sports, you spend a third of your life not preparing for two thirds of your life. Uh, is is really how it works. I mean, to be the best in the world at something. I mean, first of all, it's a privilege to do anything where you can even you know, objectively quantify how successful you are at it. I mean, we all go, well, okay, maybe if money is a criterion and your company is the biggest, but they're all subjective sort of ways to look at what you do, but tennis is so eat what you kill, and there's a number next to your name, and that number is directly related to the same thing everybody else is doing under the same platform, under the same duress, under the same schedules, and, and that's, it, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to have that opportunity to be um, sort of the, the, the best in the world, but in order to do that at, at a sport, you're talking about being one of the best in the world at your age, probably no later than mid-teens, you know? That, that means, what are you doing from, from four to 15 years old? You, you're doing everything to be better than that 15-year-old when you get there. You're, you're doing, and your life is about one thing, it's about one thing, it's about one thing, and then that only increases, it only grows, it only gets more intense. And then all of a sudden, it's over, right? It's just like, wait a second, I don't know what it's like not to have huge inventory of resources and, and, and money and, and, and people wanting me and my time and my phone's ringing. To the next day, it's over. And the only thing I can really compare it to, uh, quite honestly, is, 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 is death. Because death is one of those things that you're going to have to face you don't know what's on the other side, and you really don't know how prepared you are for it. And unfortunately, in sports, that's the case. I, I, the, the, the luxury that I had in being so disconnected with what I did on the court is I found my reason for doing what I did on the court. And that reason was a real bridge in my life to my own ownership of my life. Just because I didn't choose my life didn't mean I couldn't take ownership of it. Taking ownership means finding your reasons. I found my reason during the thick of my career, and I used that as a vehicle for not just my own inspirations to achieve on the court, but I used it as, as, a, as a life vest of sorts when I went through my, my death on, on the tennis court, which is retirement. And when I was done, I, it sort of occurred to me that the greatest thing I enjoyed on the tennis court was impacting somebody for two hours. You know, in my wife's case, 35 minutes. You know, some cases... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, some, some cases of a little bit longer, but then that came at the compromise of my own personal enjoyment, you know, but, but you, you really, you really, thank you. <laughs> uh, you. You really do, you really do find yourself going, this is kind of cool that somebody will always remember where they were when they saw this, if, if you can leave your signature on that court with pride, and that's what we all try to do every day, and hopefully you're doing that every day with all your responsibilities, and I'd leave the court and say, that was pretty cool to have that impact. But what real impact is it through the vehicle of my foundation, through the vehicle of changing generations, through the opportunity of these daunting things that Bobby's talking about in, in, the, in the greater context of, of our world's problems? You, know, you have this great opportunity to now shift, and, and I looked at it like a bigger canvas to impact not just a memory, not just a few hours, but to impact generations. Right, so rather than choosing to be a coach, rather than choosing to go into broadcasting, you chose philanthropy. And it's sort of ironic that you chose education as a, a, a person, as a child, that you were a ninth grade dropout. Uh, how is it you came across uh, education? Why was that so important to you? Yeah, I've, I, I backed into it. It's another, uh, back to the first sort of point I was making, uh, uh, hopefully I could communicate and short period of time, which is you just never know what's going to set you on, the, you know, your trajectory and what that trajectory really, really is. And, and, and for me, helping children was a given. I mean, we all enjoy making a difference to somebody, and, and I did have some opportunity, so I made a difference to kids. I clothed them, 6,000 children a year, child haven, abused uh, shelter for, uh, a shelter for abused, abandoned, neglected kids. Uh, built a boys and girls club uh, in a real, real rough part of, of, of Las Vegas. 
figuring that these after school hours are the most dangerous time in a child's life. And, and through this process, I, I don't know if it's tennis or if it's being a perfectionist, and, and maybe you all feel this way at different times in your life too, I sort of felt like w w this isn't really proactive stuff. I mean, it's, it's incredibly reactive. I mean, all we're doing is looking at problems and sort of saying, well, how can I stick a Band-Aid on it? And, and that wasn't getting the job done for me whatsoever. So when I got to the root of it, when I said, what is the very thing that to me is at least a starting point? I don't care how big the mountain is. We can take one step at a time and be proud of whatever it is what we're setting about doing and have purpose in that. I need to know where the starting point is. What's the starting point? The starting point is these kids don't have the tools for a life of their own choosing. Well, what do the tools mean? I know what it means not to have an education, being a ninth grade dropout, always being overmatched by my environment and school and books. What if I could provide for these kids the, the real opportunity for them to take ownership of their life, to have choice in their life, and to give them the tools to change the world? It's you know giving a fish and, and teaching the fish uh, mentality that I had. And then I saw this program on 60 Minutes. It was Kip, Knowledge is Power, Michael Feinberg, who's built many of these charter schools. And he was doing the same stuff. He was, he was caring is what he was doing. And by the way, a Penn grad, just for the record. Penn grad yeah. as well, yeah. Well, that's the reason why I'm here. This is where I'm on my chill. I'm not here for you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, but I watched this, and I watched him do the same thing I was doing, which is caring for these kids, but he was actually rolling his sleeves up, getting involved in their lives, and giving them the tools. And that's when I set about the Herculean task of trying to, uh, you know, trying to make a difference through education. And you did. I mean, you raised $150 million over 15 years. You changed the lives of... 175. Uh, 175. Yeah, don't. <laughs> I worked hard for that last 25 minutes. And, uh, and you changed the lives of, 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 of a number of kids. But, uh, you know, set the stage for us. Five years ago, I read your book. Uh, and I recognize that you and I shared the same passion and frustration. And I, I like to call it a warm call. Uh, you say it's a cold call, but I did call you and say yeah, I wanted to meet you. That girl in that in that in the, her dorm, yeah, that was that was also a cold entry. That wasn't was, a warm was entry. Cold. That was a cold entry. But it's amazing how when you follow, <laughs> things get warm and people light up and people want your autograph and you know, years and years of taking pictures of you. I have carpal, you know, whatever the syndrome is on my finger. It's 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 it's, it's, it's painful. But so help me set the stage of of what your thought was after we sat down that first time. Again, this all ties in to stuff hopefully you're taking away on, on a number of levels because I, I, who, who knew that I would be here doing this, right? And I don't mean here tonight, I mean in the space of really uh, taking a bite out of the national um, issue of, of, of education. But, but I always kept myself open and I always kept myself pursuing how to get better every day. You know, I was number one in the world, I was number 140 in the one in the world, and I got back to number one to only recognize the similarity in all of it, which is, doesn't matter. You're 141, you can't get there again. You're too old, you're number one, who do you look to? The only thing you can control is how you, how you handle yourself every day and how do you get yourself better. So that was my pursuit with education, and, and 630 kids went to, went to 1,300 kids because I found a way to maximize the facility better. And I did some things, but the waiting list still stayed the same. And, and I just didn't know how to scale it. I tried it through legislation. I tried it through some replication of people who were going to build it in their community, and I could share best practices. It, it, was, it just wasn't scalable, certainly wasn't sustainable, until I met you. As you well know, the, the trajectory of my life changed at that point because it gave me an incredible vehicle to now go out and pursue um, a very, what, what at the time, and I don't think it's that much anymore, at the time it was, it was risky to do what we did. I mean, you spend your life as a philanthropist, and now all of a sudden you're claiming that going into the for-profit traditional capital space is, is almost inherently in conflict. If anything, you could you know, people would even go further and say, well, if you are now taking your philanthropy and you're transitioning into monetizing it, you know, that sounds a little skeptical, you know, and, and, and I, I knew that. I knew it would be a, a, a journey of, of walking where angels dare to tread. I mean, it, it comes with that. I'm not adverse to risk in my life, as, as some of you may know, um, probably through your parents at this stage watching me play over the years. Um, you, you'll know that, uh, yeah, I wore jean shorts on a tennis court because I didn't, I didn't get why this was such a, 
high-end deal. I mean, there's a lot of people that should be out here appreciating what the hell I'm putting myself through. And, you know, you take that risk and you realize that, okay, there's some benefit to it, calculated risk. You know, I wrote my book. You read it if you want, you know, the whole deal. But the truth is, I did it differently. And, and, but the upside of doing it, again, is, is the impact. So when I got to the place where I had to really wrestle with that idea, it boiled down to one simple question. You know, and the question was, what's the alternative? Okay, what if I don't take this risk? What if I don't pursue this? That really means that hundreds of thousands of seats aren't going to be provided for those that know how to educate our future. How do I say no to that? And that was what I committed to, separate from what I thought this journey was going to be. I, I, don't, I don't think it's in that space now. People do recognize uh, how you need it to, to really do something sustainable. Uh, but I'm grateful to Bobby. He gives me a lot of credit for not working since we met. Uh, you know, I give you a lot of credit for, for literally giving me um, a, a, a new career. You know? and, and, and the career, when I say career, I don't mean opportunity. I mean, I mean an expression of everything that I've spent my life and time trying to provide and doing it on a, on a doing it on, uh, if we weren't talking about sports, I'd say steroids, but where, you know, I've, you've allowed me to do this in a way that was uh, unthinkable. Uh, and now uh, it's, 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 we get to share it, you know, we get to take people along for the ride. Did, did you ever, in your wildest dreams, think that raising a private equity fund focused on changing systematic policy and education would be this hard? Is it easier to win a grand slam? Or is it easier to raise a private equity fund focused on changing the political landscape of education? Um, I, always, I always prefer knowing my enemy, you know, and, and, uh, and I always knew my enemy on a tennis court. You know, I knew he was a faceless person with strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, we had to spend a lot of time understanding who our enemies were, so to speak, you know, what, what opponent we were really facing and, and what strengths they had and, and what weaknesses they had. And, and that's tougher, you know, to convince somebody when you go to a monster, you know, company and you're talking to their CIO and you're explaining them the merits of the actual investment and they think it's wonderful and they kick you to the program side because it's about social impact. And you go to the program side who's giving away money and they think what you're doing is incredible, except we're charged with giving away our money. You know, we're not really responsible for investing it. We actually give it away. And so, well, wait a second. Can you just give it to me then? <laughs> and then maybe I'll pass it to Bobby in a few years, and he can set another brown paper bag on your doorstep with more money that you can give to somebody else. I mean, it doesn't make any sense we're not sitting in the room recognizing that if we just put our, our hats together, if we just figured out a way, this is a sustainable, scalable approach towards one of our issues. And there's, and there's many to be dealt with. It was, it was amazing. I remember we spent uh, a year on the road, and we came across four kinds of investors. We, we <laughs> joke. We came across uh, the unionists. We came across the capitalists. We came across the, the, uh, communists. the communists. I remember that. And we came across the realists. And the, the unionists were those teachers unions for whom I had managed billions of dollars for the years. And I remember Andre and I would go up and we'd sit down in, in front of the California state teachers, the New York state teachers, and we'd say, we have a great investment opportunity for you. It's going to do two times equity multiple, 17% returns. It has to do with the, uh, the, the health of society. It's an environment which is growing at 15% compounded per annum, all the great metrics, compelling reasons. And in every case, they would look at us and say, we're in. We'll take, in one instance, we'll take half the fund. And they then would say, well, what's the asset class, by the way? And we would say, but are you sure you're in? And they'd say, we're in, really sure, really super sure. You swear, pinky swear, that you're going to invest in the fund. And they'd say, pinky swear, what the fuck's the investment? <laughs> and we would say, charter schools. And then there'd be this deafening silence. <laughs> yeah. And they'd say, nice to meet you. And you'd realize, and you'd say, well, nice to meet you. What's the issue here? And the, and the unions would say, well, you know, charter schools are the nemesis of the public school district. For every charter school job created, it's the loss of a charter school job. And Andre would say, well, you know, the reality is, is the intent of this fund is not to undermine the unions. In fact, we're incredibly pro-union. It's just the children's union that we're focusing on. And as long as education is going to be about adults, we're going to have problems. It should be about children. 
the capitalists were amazing too, because again, if you're from Wharton, your job is to maximize returns. You're not, your job is not to help society. And we met with a, a number of organizations that liked the business model, um, but really didn't like our business model. They thought it was an interesting investment in infrastructure. The average age of a high school was 40 years old. The Army Corps of Engineers had estimated that the uh, deferred maintenance was $800 billion to bring these schools up to code. Um, but Andre and I had a business model that was a, a benevolent model where it was a bridge to ownership. What we do is we build a great school for a great operator, uh, and we bridge them to a time when they can afford to purchase the school from us by accessing cheaper cost of capital in the municipal bond market. Well, we won't mention, you can't mention George Soros' team by Not name, Not by right? name, no. no. So we won't mention George. But George, <laughs> he said, uh, I like your business model. We'll take the whole fund, but you've got to change the business plan. I don't want you to sell the schools back to the operators. I want you to roll up all those schools into a public REIT and maximize shareholder value. And Andre goes, but that's not what we want to do. And, I, and his team said, well, then I'll meet you. We will meet you in the sandbox. We will compete with you. And we said, I think you said, bring it on, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. We're trying to empower the people that know how to educate our future and give them ownership. And the capitalist is trying to say, well, wait a second. They have a significant need. We can really leverage that and sort of take advantage. Like, well, that's what's kind of one of the things that's broken. So let's not go down that road. And I mean, it's hard to say no to, to, to 400 million bucks. Um, but the truth is, it's not what we were interested well, and in. And also. They were speculating, because to be sure and confident that in five years from now, the public markets would be receptive to a private equity REIT focused on education, we didn't know. Right. But in our business model, we have an alignment of interest where we had a built-in exit strategy to the charter school operator. The third were the communists, uh, and they were amazing. We met with China Investment Corporation, and at the end of our presentation, uh, the gentleman from China looked at Andre. Uh, he never looked at me once the entire time. Uh, it was always you, you, you. But anyway, he looked at him, him, him. And he said, I love looking, the fund. I was looking up. Love the fund. And. <laughs> no, he was. I mean, I just remember, he was yelling at me like he, this. He, he, who was? <laughs> and uh, he looked at Andre and said, I get it. Why are you I, yelling at me? I will take 100% of the fund. And Andre, for those to know <laughs> Andre or those who will love Andre, um, Andre is inquisitive beyond his, 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 his years. And better judgment as well, beyond my better judgment. Better judgment. But he asked, before he asked the question, I knew we were in trouble because he leaned into the table. And whenever Andre leans in, he's going to lead with a question, but he's, he's authentic. The best example is many years ago on a Sunday morning, my wife and I got a call at about 7 a.m. on a Sunday, and Andre goes, I need help with math. And I'm like, well, I need help with my forehand. What do you want? <laughs> he goes, Jade and his 10-year-old son had a math test on Monday. And you said to me, he goes, I'm having a hard time explaining multiplication to my son. And I'm like, well, I'm Warden. My wife next to me was Warden. This is easy for us. You called the right place. You were laughing at me, though, right? Yeah, we are laughing. He goes, OK, help me understand. Minus 3 times minus 3. I'm like, yeah. He goes, how in the world can that be a positive thing? <laughs> he goes, I lose three matches to Pete. I lose three more matches to Pete. I it's lose not, three times it, that. I've lost nine times. I hate happy. the guy more. Can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I say to Andre, I said, well, think about it this way. If you do a bad thing to a bad person, that's a good thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's... But I couldn't. Andre goes, no, no, I don't buy that. He goes, why is minus 3 times minus 3 positive 9? And I said, I do not know. <laughs> and I looked at my wife, and she said, I do not know. And I said to Andre, I said, you know something? It's just one of those things you have to memorize. It's one of those tenets in math. Just memorize it. Still unacceptable to he me. He goes, you may choose to live your life that way. <laughs> and I'm like, that was cold. OK, I don't want to learn my forehand. My forehand's fine. So Andre now leans in. And I'm like, oh, shit, we're in trouble. Andre goes to the gentleman from CIC, I am so honored and so appreciative. But please explain to me. Why does the government of China want to invest in a private equity real estate fund focused on education in America? And the gentleman he looks at us and says, Mr. Agassi, your country is indebted to my country to the tune of $2 trillion. He said, actually, with all disrespect. He did. I thought there was a language problem. I did, too, yeah. <laughs> That's why I'll never. With all disrespect intended. Yes. And I said, was that due respect, or was that? Disrespect. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we're reliving this. They're, they're, they're carry on. It was Go. disrespect, I yeah. think. And he goes, with all disrespect intended, your country 
is indebted to my country to the tune of $2 trillion. And none of us here today at this table will be alive to see that debt repaid. Therefore, we, the government of China, have got to rely upon the next generation of Americans to grow your economy out of the debt you owe us, and you're not doing it. And you're failing. Now, that was like, Andre goes, that was code. I said, we're not taking the money, right? He goes, we're not taking the money. And I said, well, we're not taking the money yeah, unless we can't find it elsewhere. And then you're going to play every exhibition match in Shanghai we need <laughs> to get that money back. But we didn't take it. No. We didn't. And uh, we were fortunate that after the unionists, after the capitalists, after the communists, we found the realists. Yeah. And the realists were folks like Citibank and Bill Ackman from Pershing Square. Personal Wealth, Foundation Wealth. University, uh, University of Michigan. University Endowments. Uh, I mean, a wide spectrum of people who had the ability to really understand that this was the only way to, to do it in a sustainable way. You know, people said that people who said that what are the consequences of not investing in a fund like this? And if they answered it's unconscionable, then they became an investor. And I tell Andre that you know, the first fund is always the most difficult. So we raised $210 million uh, about three and a half years ago. We've turned that into $500 million worth of schools by the August of next year. You know, 70 schools, 36,000 school seats. The operators own their facilities. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's changed both of our lives. But the reality is, is we're just getting started because the issues are there's still a million students in America on a wait list for a great public charter school. Hmm. So a million schools, we have 100,000 more schools to build. And just to be clear on the charter school front, because being an educational institution here, I mean, it's not that we think charter schools is the end all to education. It's not at all that way, but, but there, it's competition. And the best in class operators are really outperforming their district peers. 85% don't because they're mom and pop shops a bit like mine who are just fed up with the options or the lack of options for their children and their education. But that top 15%, I mean, they have dozens if not hundreds of schools where they are absolutely outperforming their district peers, providing these kids with uh, opportunities they never would have dreamed of. And so instead of trying to do things in a silo, what if we could be the vehicle that allows them to expand their footprint in a way they never, uh, never would have uh, been able to do otherwise. So I want to ask you a question. I've never asked you this one either. Your dad. I know your dad, you always tell me the story that, you know, did you want to play tennis? And you would always respond, well, did I want to have a ping pong paddle taped to my, you know, my, my right hand when I was six months old? And my dad have a ping pong ball above me. Um, your dad was obviously incredibly proud of your tennis career. What's he think about this new career? Um, you know, he's very old school, so a fair question deserves a fair answer. He's, he wants to know the economics. <laughs> he's, you know, his, his, the def, success for him was, was money. Uh, he never had it. He spent all his time giving his uh, children what he never had. And, you know, and I've learned a lot from him. I've learned what I want to be, what I don't want to be in some respects. I spent a lot of time giving my children what I never had, but sometimes forget to give them what I did, which is you know, that sort of focus and intensity. He, he doesn't understand the model at large. He sees these openings, and tears come to his eyes, and he just, uh, he just thinks, I'm so glad I'm the greatest tennis coach in the history of the world to teach you how to play the way you did so that, you know, all this stuff can happen, and I try to remind them that I have three siblings, and they didn't quite do it, so why does, <laughs> you know, I was, well, I mean, why do you t take credit here, but then you, you know, it, it, so things don't line up, so I'm not sure we need his, his, his insight into, into our fund, but, um, but, but, again, but we all, as children of, 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 of parents, we want to please them. Right. And do you get the sense that he recognizes what a game changer the second chapter of your life is in so many other people's lives, or is it, uh, it doesn't phase him? He listens to me, and that's never been that way. <laughs> you know, uh, he's, and there's just a, there's just a respect uh, that has come with it. Uh, you know, he's always been a generous person, and that's, that's true. You know, I, I've watched him, he, even when he didn't have a lot, he gave a lot. Uh, and seeing what we're doing and seeing what I am through his eyes, what I'm able to give to so many, uh, really touches a part of him. Uh, you know, I, I, sometimes you wonder if it's uh, pride or if it's 
flat out jealousy because he just he's just he's engulfed in uh, in the reality that so much is happening in these people's lives as a result of what we're what we're given. Yeah. So legacy obviously is hugely important to, to both of us. And I always tell and I say this every time I'm here. Many years ago, my daughter came to me and said, "Daddy, what do you want your epitaph to read?" And of course, I responded the same response always is, "Daddy went to Wharton. I have no idea what the word epitaph means." <laughs> um, and she explained to me that it's what do you want your tombstone to read. And I said, you know, when I graduated Wharton, I wanted my tombstone to read, Daddy you know, had the most change in his pocket. Um, and as I've gotten older and wiser, it's now Daddy made the most change in the world. Um, your epitaph, what do you want it to read? Oof. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I mean, for me, I think the only thing that is, one of the things that has stayed truly the same throughout my life in tennis and, and, and now post-tennis I got asked the same question about legacy in the sport, you know, and it, I, I didn't really care about the titles and, you know, and the numbers, but I did care about the sport being better off as a result of having me. Uh, I felt like that was really important to me, and I didn't want to hurt the game. Uh, I wanted to add to it. I wanted to leave it in a better place uh, for, for being there. And it's just hard not to look at life uh, to not look at that as a microcosm sort of of life. Uh, I just, I, I want everybody that I'm in contact with to be better off as a result of our time spent together. Uh, and what we're doing is, 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 is that, you know, intensified, uh, making a difference in this world and, and knowing that if you weren't here, that difference wouldn't have been made is, uh, is a powerful feeling while you're alive. I'm not sure how much I'm going to care about it when I'm gone. Um, you know, I'll tell you later. We'll I'll see you there. Speak on the other side. But until then, um, leaving this place better off is, uh, is pretty inspiring.